G'day traders, Rich here. Um, in this uh, particular episode, uh, we're going to carry on from our last few episodes where we talked about um, the principles of compounding and how important that is and how you can only get that principle of compounding impacting on your performance results if you have very robust strategies that can survive over extended periods and over a broad range of different market conditions. Now, um, for the majority of, of traders who are looking for design solutions to trade a current market, they clearly are, are focusing on current market conditions. And what we say is that um, a better approach is to look at design solutions that are robust over a, a very large data sample. Now the reason we do that is that if you can survive over that very large data sample, um, the benefits of compounding are what uh, dominantly contribute to your overall performance results. But if you cannot generate that, that necessary um, small positive expectancy, you will never get anywhere in this world and your, your prospects as an investor or, or a trader over the long term are very limited. So with this particular approach, this trend following approach we adopt, we are prepared to sacrifice the immediate market condition in recognition of the fact that uh, there are more robust solutions out there that can offer a, a small edge and that is all that is sufficient um, because we are after the king hits that are delivered by the compounding effect over the very long term. So um, one of the strong reasons for why we prefer this approach is that over the course of a trader's history, they spend much of their time investing their efforts in looking at different systems. Now, ultimately, you must make a decision to stick to one form of strategy or another. And when we look at uh, what has been successful over the very long term, we inevitably arrive to the conclusion that there is really only one form of method that has a proven track record over 20, 30, 50 years that um, can sustain the broad array of different market conditions that are thrown at it. And that is um, systematic, diversified, trend-following approaches. <clears throat> systematic is necessary because you must divorce um, yourself from overriding your system rules. Um, systematic because you need this operating 24-7. Um, systematic because that is the only way you can develop benchmarks and a method of, of tracking your overall performance results. If you are a discretionary trader who doesn't use a systematic approach, you can never track your long-term performance, um, only over the live track record. Um, you cannot effectively backtest um, these strategies if you are a discretionary trader as the levels of discretion required for the instantaneous trade decision or the exit decision um, cannot be mimicked in, in um, true form over a very long term backtest. So, and systematic as well keeps us honest as we know that um, we have not been involved in the decision making process over the course of that test range and um, we can therefore determine the strengths or weaknesses of our system if it has been applied systematically and we can identify the reasons for its underperformance or overperformance and correspondingly adjust it. Um, diversified, well there are so many benefits to diversification. Um, we might not have received the same degree of diversification benefits these days across market sectors as many have become more and more correlated. However, um, system diversification uh, gives you the way out of this obstacle where um, as opposed to a, a form of correlation, when you are looking at system design, you can actually get a better result through a, a a factor called co-integration. Um, co-integration is a more hard, hard form of correlation which relates to um, the, the, the way that um, different return streams uh, move um, together um, by virtue of design relationships. Now that enforces a, a static relationship over the long term as opposed to a variable relationship that say correlation between markets gives you. So 
um, look, rather than wax on lyrical, um, we'll get these tests starting. So this particular podcast, um, we'll be looking at um, a, a long-term walkthrough of, of uh, 50 years um, on the Euro USD. Um, and so what we want to focus on in this particular episode um, is uh, the importance of of using a, a degree of data mining to ensure that your strategy adjusts over time in response to market conditions. So I'll get this back test running and then I'll explain what's happening. So we're on Euro, Euro USD from 1970 up to the current day. Uh, we've got a, a spread of 20 points, which is double our current spread in the market, and we'll get this running. So I'll just turn off here. So on visualization mode so we can talk as we go along. Won't be a second as I set this up. Okay, so here we go. Now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to um, reduce this scale so we can see what's going on and um, let it run as I'm talking. So to explain how this particular strategy has been developed, the, the first thing we need to understand is that in the trend following space, it is the design of our solution that is important. Um, when you apply um, data mining techniques to trend following systems, there's only a limited amount of curve fitting that can occur, provided your design solution has been um, developed to allow for um, open-ended profits and um, uh, cutting losses short at all times. The design solution itself enforces this regime or this design considerations into all of your systems uh, that uh, mean that um, um, in traditional uh, data mining processes, um, for instance using strategy quant or using um, other forms of data mining software, uh, their method of data mining is to use data mining as a method to identify strategies. Now, what that does is it brings in a notion of curve fitting into the result, whereby some of those design strategies may have been cooked up by that system by virtue of simple random influences in the creation of that design. That therefore has no logical uh, foundation to the underlying price and it is just an outcome of random luck that that system has managed uh, to be generated which has been applied to that, um, that particular range of market conditions. And what you typically find with the, those form of data mining processes is that as soon as you meet new market conditions, those strategies fall over. So with our trend following processes, the first thing we do is we need to um, cook up a design uh, which has not been influenced by the, um, the curve fitting process or the data mining process, which forces a, a particular outcome. And in this outcome, we're after an asymmetric uh, return to risk profile. We want a design solution that ensures that if markets are trending, either long or short, uh, we get a significant windfall provided uh, we have a trailing stop loss, an initial stop loss, and no fixed profit target. So by implementing that design principle, then when we undertake data mining, we allow a degree of variation around that core design principle to take, um, to take the benefit of the more recent um, uh, market conditions in our test sample. So for instance, for this particular test, uh, which has been undertaken from 1970 to 2020, the current day, we actually um, designed these particular um, um, algorithms that are trend following in nature using a sample size or an in-sample range of 20 years from the year 2000 up to 2020. We needed a very broad in-sample data range to ensure that um, once we had um, embedded that design principle into all of our systems, the degree of variation that occurs from that in-sample range of curve fitting uh, means that we need a broad um, data range of data here to capture a, a large number of different market conditions. 
If we, for instance, had only taken an in-sample component of one year from, say, the current um, year back, only one year back, we would therefore be forcing our core design systems to respond to that most recent degree of market condition over the last year. Now the problems of that is that we recognise that trends come few and far between. There might be only three trends per year or two trends per year or no trends per year on a particular market. Therefore, when we undertake any data mining operation um, to refine our design strategies, we need a very large data sample. So in this particular exercise here, which is running underway, uh, these particular EAs have been configured to respond to the conditions of the last 20 years, and then we apply it over a 50-year look back to see has it performed well over that 50-year look back. Now, as this strategy has been progressing, we're now from 1970, we're now up to 1992, clearly this is all out of sample, and the strategy has been performing marvellously. Um, the equity curves uh, is progressively rising over this out of sample period, and we're happy with that result. When we go and actually have a look at the, uh, the design parameters themselves that are in the system, we are using a Donkian breakout system here. And our optimization process, uh, for a start, in our Donkian breakout system, the design has already been configured. And the design demands that we have an initial stop loss, we have a trailing stop loss, uh, we have a, a, a break-even multiplier in this instance, so they are the core design requirements. And then our optimization process then looks at the particular values over the last 20 years that have produced the best risk-adjusted returns. So when we talk about risk-adjusted returns, we're not talking about which has produced the best profits or which has produced the lowest drawdown. We are looking at which have produced the best risk-adjusted returns. So which have produced the best return to risk relationship. And the way we do that is by using the Ma ratio. Um, uh, other terms for the Ma, the Cal Ma ratio is a very similar ratio to the Ma ratio. But what these ratios do is it looks at the, the compound annual growth rate of that return stream, and then it divides it by the maximum drawdown of that return stream. In looking at those two features, the compound annual growth rate and the drawdown, you are looking at a risk-adjusted relationship. So the better results from a risk-adjusted relationship produce the, the lower degree of volatility pound for pound in relation to the, the compound annual growth rate they achieve. So in this particular 20-year um, backtest, these are the settings that were generated during our optimization and iteration process. You can see that we have a broad range of different uh, value sets for each of the strategies. So our Donkian strategy has been applied to all of these solutions. And there are, um, in this particular case, there are 10 solutions being applied here for this trend following model that produces these results. You can see some of these solutions operating here. This is, this is the trades they are undertaking. Notice how when you get trending environments, a large number of these solutions are activated and they each respond to different possible trend trajectories. This is this diversification of system approach. So when we talk about uh, this example, we are using one system, which is a Donkian system, but we've got a diversification of parameters or parameter values used. In this case, the Donkian ranges between 50 up to, in this instance, 300. Um, some of the solutions, or many of the solutions, are centered around a 100 period look back. The ATR period, which is used to um, uh, define the stop loss multiplier and, and um, trailing stop and break even multiplier, varies. So we are uh, allowing for a degree of variation in the, the more recent to the more, more longer term um, um, average true range and volatility of price. The stop loss multiplier is fairly consistent, showing a fairly tight st initial stop losses applied to our strategy. But as you get to um, some of these solutions, they do allow a more breathing room with that initial stop loss. 
but the, the, there is a sacrifice there in relation to the fact that a tighter stop loss produces a, 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 um, a more position size, so a higher position size, a, a, um, a stop loss that gives you more breathing room, has a reduced position size. So there's a trade-off going on in that relationship. The trailing stop has a range of values from 2 up to 9 ATR. The break-even multiplier also has a range of values. So this, this basically says that uh, when prices move to these levels of ATR and break-even, it moves to a break-even position. So this is the optimised series of, of results. Over the last 20 years, we've optimised it to say that these produce the best risk-adjusted returns over the 20 years. And then we're applying it to a 50-year a, a um, back test and saying, well, if those results have applied for the last 20 years, there's a good chance they're going to be valid over the 50 years. So in this case, that is clearly the result. Uh, we are now up to 2008. So um, in 2000, we started getting into our in-sample period. But we note that the trajectory hasn't considerably changed between our outer sample and our in-sample component. So that is um, suggesting strongly that this is not a curve fit result. What we are actually doing here is, um, in relation to our video yesterday, we suggested that the nature of trends have changed. What were initially very simple, clean um, trends uh, between 1970 up to 2000, uh, when markets were less mature, um, have now become much more highly volatile and much more messy in nature. They still trend, but the degree of volatility that exists in the market um, is contributed to by the broad range of different market participants that are now uh, actively trading within the market from, from central banks, um, hedges, speculators um, such as ourselves, uh, using mean reversion systems, using trend following systems, um, using a range of different types of methodologies. That, that plethora of market participant mix now uh, means that there are competing um, effects occurring on those trends which make them messy or more volatile. We can see that in the nature of trends. So what we're saying is that as trends mature we need to be able to adapt our methods. So that's why we look at the last 20 years and say, um, rather than look at the entire 50-year period and start off with a trend-following system and expect it to perform in the same manner over the, um, the next 100 years or so, we say that um, over periods of time we need to be able to adapt our systems to more recent market conditions to reflect the fact that markets change. Trends still occur, but the nature of the trend changes. So in this instance, um, we're getting now to 2014, um, and we can see that uh, clearly uh, this doesn't appear to be a curve fit result. The next walkthrough we're going to do, we're going to choose our own values as opposed to any optimised values, but under the same principle of diversification. Now the reason we're going to do that is to clearly demonstrate how these are robust um, design-led solutions as opposed to possible curve fit solutions. Um, and that is simply because we are enforcing um, trend-following logic into every single one of our design solutions. So for those traders who have been using Strategy Quant and EA Factory and Adapt, Adapt Trade as a method to mine particular strategies, they will might come to a conclusion over the course of time that um, to expect data mining to be able to generate its own strategies is a bit of a furphy. You first need to design your own strategy logic and that forces a broad constraint into what that overall design can achieve. We are wanting a trend following logic here, so something with open-ended profit potential, cut losses short at all times, that enforces a strict logic into every single one of our designs then we allow a degree of curve fitting around that from our data mining processes to adapt our trend following logic to more recent market conditions. Um, that is also why we do not use Monte Carlo testing as a means to um, validate our tests and we do not use walk forward testing. The reason for that is that the Monte Carlo approach and the walk forward approach encourages you to choose a solution which is honed for more recent market conditions. 
it encourages you to choose those solutions which produce that lovely, nice ascending linear equity curve. We know that the reality of trend following is that that nice linear ascending equity curve over the long term does not exist. There are periods of stagnation, there are periods of necessary drawdown, and there are periods of spectacular growth. That therefore produces a step up profile as opposed to a linear profile of our equity curve. And for instance, here's a step up here, 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 here's a step up here. These all respond to trending periods. Here are declining stagnating periods, here's a stagnating period, here's a stagnating period. There we are now going through a stagnating period where uh, drawdowns are building. So we have a volatile um, return stream, but it's a robust return stream. We do not demand these nice linear ascending equity curves. So if you are using Monte Carlo or walk forward approaches, which segment your, your data into segments with the expectation that you get strong growth in every segment, or that you get a, a nice um, splayed linear Monte Carlo signature of your return streams, that is forcing you towards a convergent mean reverting solution that is applicable to particular market conditions. So we avoid that in its entirety. Um, so this particular test has now been undertaken. Um, so what we're going to do is uh, we are going to now save this report. Now the reason I'm saving this report um, is because uh, I want to demonstrate how uh, the difference between an optimised process and one that is just hand-picked and selected. Um, so we've saved this report, and this report um, says that we started with $100,000, we ended up with $105 million after 50 years, our profit factor was 2.15, our maximum drawdown over the period was 26.84%. Now I'm going to save this, and I'm going to put it into a, a particular piece of software called Quant Analyzer, which enables us to look at a few more um, important statistics. So I'm now just going to open up Quant Analyzer, and I'm going to draw that test into um, Quant Analyzer. Um, so this is the optimised solution for the 20-year period, and now we've just now incorporated that strategy into a Quant Analyzer. We'll have a look at that later. So the next thing I want to do is say, right, so that was using an optimised series of values. What I'm saying now is, well, hold on a bit. Um, let's choose our own values. Now, what we're doing here is we're saying, well, if we choose our own values, um, then we can't be accused of curve fitting. What this uh, demonstrates is, in this instance, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start from a, a Donkian period of 50, and then I'm going to lift it each, each step by, uh, let's go, 1.5. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to round this. So, and then I'm going to apply this formula down the board. Um, zero. Right. So now I'm going to set all of these values to be diverse. So what we're doing is we're saying from the prior Donkian period, the next strategy has a, a Donkian period of 1.5, the, the prior Donkian period. So we've gone 75, 113, 170, 355, all the way up to 1,943. Um, I'm also going to say, well, for this purpose, I'm just going to use a 10 period ATR for everything. And my stop loss multiplier, I'm going to start off with a fairly tight stop loss multiplier of one. Let's go down a few. Then I'm going to lift it to two. Then I'm going to go to three and maybe four. Um, actually, I'll make that four. I'll, I'll get a bit more variation in here. Let's go to two from there. And let's put a couple of threes here. Two, 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 one, 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 two, 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 three. Now, the reason we're doing this is our stop loss multiplier is responding to these Donkian periods. Now, the broader Donkian periods, what we want for our design is to give a bit of breathing room um, and allow these to run for very long periods of time. That's why um, we're using an initial stop that progressively um, increases our breathing room. Um, the trailing stop multiplier in ATR, I'm going to start from two 
and let's do something crazy here. Let's add one ATR to each of these solutions. So we start with a trailing stop of 2, end up with a trailing stop of 11 ATR. The break-even multiplier, all I'm doing here is saying once it's gone the same um, move as the initial stop, I want to move it to break-even. So I'm going to configure these to be the same as the stop-loss multiplier. So you'll all agree now we have set our own values here. There is no optimization here. This is just using our design logic and choosing values accordingly. So now I'm going to save these results and now I'm going to run this test again and then we're going to compare the results. So we're going now. Certainly seems to be going quite well, especially in the beginning periods. And now I'm just going to reduce this size a bit and we'll talk as we go on. So we have set our values. Um, in this case, we have set our values to be quite broad. I'll just check. It's beautiful. Okay. So let's discuss it. So we've talked about how, yes, we do um, provide a degree of optimization using a, a broad 20 year period to ensure that as our models progress, um, they slowly adapt to um, more recent market conditions. Now, 20 years is a long period of time, so it's certainly not recent in, in trading terms, but in the context of our entire testing period of 50 years, that is a representative measure of the in-sample component to the out-of-sample component. The second thing we do is we choose a diverse range of values. So we're not relying on a single strategy with a single value set because we don't know what each of these individual strategies will produce. What we do is we collectively offer a diverse range of values that respond to the trend-following design logic because we don't know which ones are going to work. Which, which of those design values um, is going to be, uh, produce a, a great outcome with a trend? So let's have a look at this closely. As a trend's progressing, you get trend trajectories in a lot of different ways. This is a fairly classic trend trajectory, but um, here um, a lot of single systems would have been whipsawed out. Now, as we saw, a lot of our solutions did close, um, and, but the trend continued to this point here. So we've got further solutions that reopen to catch that move up. Um, but trends have a range of different trajectories, um, from, from slow declining trends, fast moving trends. So you, this diverse range of strategies, so in this case, this diverse range of value sets that we've chosen here, captures a broad range of different types of trajectory. As it's coming down here, this is a steep decline here. We've got large numbers of strategies firing away. Um, and we can see that um, with this non-optimized result, it's producing marvelous results. This is simply because of our design logic accompanied by a diverse range of trend-following value sets. When we are in unfavorable market conditions, only a few of these trigger off, but when we are in strongly trending conditions, a large number of them fire off at the same time. That is what's giving this kick up in this overall equity curve. It's the diversity of strategies that are taking advantage of the trending condition. So the two things that um, we feel are important is one, adapt your models using using um, more recent in-sample data to ensure that your models are responding to the more recent nature of trends, which these days are more messy. And two, diverse value sets. Now this is one system. We've got many more models, um, such as um, um, Bollinger breakout models, um, moving average crossover models. This is just one simple strategy, the Donkin strategy, which we're using for these uh, latest examples we've been demonstrating because we've just cooked this one up. Um, but uh, it's just to demonstrate that um, you should get diversity in value sets, you should get diversity in trend following models themselves, and you should get diversity across markets. This is just one market, Euro USD, but we need diversity across a broad range of markets. When you have all of those going together, um, the, the portfolio compilations you can achieve are spectacular. And um, you suddenly realize that the world's best trend followers in the trend following space, this is what they're doing. 
Uh, you can achieve these results with as little as $100,000. However, the, the question you've got to make is, can I stick with that over the long term? Now, the reason why you would definitely consider investing in these CTAs, the Practice Diversified Trend Following, is because you give them your money, they apply this principle to it, and over the long term, that wealth builds through the principles of compounding, as we've discussed. It divorces you from the decision-making process. That is a very essential requirement when you need patience, you need long term, to adopt these models. But this does not mean that people can't do it themselves. But if they do it themselves, they've got to be clever how they go about it. The first thing they've got to do is they say, who are the best trend traders in the world? What are the techniques they're using? And how can I apply those techniques? Most traders who enter this game think that they are cleverer than the market. And they can cook up their own specific technique, which is well beating. Well, after, as I'm getting close to my retirement age now, I can tell you um, that is a, a fruitless game because you'll spend your life investing in R&D and developing trading strategies and forgetting about the core principle of this is that once you have found a system with small positive expectancy that is robust, you trade it, you invest it, and you are prepared to invest it over a very long-term period. Only then will you get the principle of compounding. So if you spend your life investing in R&D, not trading these simple systems, when you get to 50 years old and you think you've nutted it out, like I'm now 55, I think I've nutted it out now, I'm now sitting here with regret, tons of regret that I didn't learn this and listen to this and think I was, uh, I was smarter than, than the others who have successfully applied this approach. I should have realised this in my 30s because then I would have invested my 100,000 and 50 years later I'd now be retiring on hundreds of millions of dollars with no effort from myself simply by applying this systematic process. That is the way you make your fortunes in this world. There are no get-rich-quick schemes but there are certainly solid, robust schemes that use the principle of, of compounding to generate these huge, magnificent returns over the long term. But anyway, back to this strategy. As we're going along, we see that, well, things seem to be performing admirably here. Um, so, and this is a, a non-optimised solution. Let's see how uh, we come, we're coming with 2012 now. Uh, we'll soon be entering that 2014 um, downturn in the Euro USD. We'll see how it performs then. But uh, we've got this progressive consistent growth. Now this is a bit deceptive as during the course of this time there are many years of stagnation and slow building drawdowns. So this is why you need to divorce yourself from your system rules because during these periods you are going to be second guessing yourself and saying this strategy doesn't work. It clearly does work but you've got to be patient. And most people, most investors, as they're going through this period, would not have the tenacity to stay on, either with their own solutions or if they've allocated their monies towards these CTAs, they wouldn't have the gumption to hold on, despite the fact that quite clearly over this entire period there is a positive edge at play. <clears throat> but people want immediate satisfaction. This is where investors need to adopt a different perspective. Wealth building returns are generated through the principle of compounding through very simple, diversified and robust systems. Um, so we've got through the 2014 period with a lovely uplift in our equity. So things are going well here. But what we want to do is at the end of this exercise, we want to compare and contrast this non-optimised result against our optimised result and see the differences. because. If the differences are material in nature, that is going to be material in nature to the compounding effect. Um, so, now clearly people uh, using this range of solutions would say, there you go, I've produced something that has not been curve fit in the least. Yeah, I've chosen my own parameters. But remember, curve fitting occurs as soon as you design a strategy. As soon as you enforce design principles into a strategy and trade those rules, it inevitably is curve fit for a particular market condition. 
We have curved fit our design principles to meet trend following logic, but then we have further optimised those values to take account of the, the noise and the degree of mean reversion that affects that overall trend following logic. So we've got that report now, it's just generating. Once that's occurred, I'm going to save it to that quant analyzer and then we'll compare and contrast the results. So it shouldn't be too long. Uh, such a long back test, it takes a while for the report to generate. Uh, but clearly, um, great result on that equity curve um, using non-optimised values. Uh, we've gone from 100,000 up to equity of uh, um, around about 700, uh, seven, uh, 70 million dollars here over a 50 year period, just by applying this simple strategy on the Euro USD. So the report's been generated now and I'm just going to save it to my quant analyzer. Um, so we'll call this the diverse, we've done the optimized one already, so I've saved that report. Okay, so let's have a look at this report. So um, 67, total net profit, 67 million, uh, one, one, two, three, four, five, six, 67 million from 100,000 start, Maximum drawdown 46%. That's going to be important. So now what we'll do is I'm going to bring Quant Analyzer into the picture so we can compare on contrast both results. So this was the diverse solution, not the optimised solution. So what we'll do first is we're going to have a look down here at these rows here, these two rows here. Um, we'll just have a look at which ones they were. Okay, so this top one is the optimised solution. This last one was the last test we ran, which was just our selection of our own diverse strategies. The same number of strategies, but a diverse splay of values. So the first thing we note is that the compound annual growth rate of both of them is similar. 14.95 uh, is better for the optimised result over the 50 year period, and 13.91. It clearly shows that they're not curve fit. They're still strongly performing. Um, this, this over the entire 15 year, year, uh, 50 years produced close to 14% compound annual growth rate. That is a marvellous figure. When, when people think of compound annual growth rate, they probably don't appreciate what that means. And I'm going to show you what it means. So uh, let's select that strategy, so the diverse strategy, and let's have a look at our monthly results. So we start with $100,000. In the first year, we make $54,000. So in that particular year, we make a 50% return on our equity. You can see these, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight years of positive results, extreme equity results. Some of the months are negative. Um, we have a bad year here in 1979, but only $11,000 is lost in this case. Then uh, 1981 comes along, 2.3 uh, million is generated. You can see that it's outliers that are dominating our results here. And as time goes on, uh, we still get uh, very good results, but our losses tend to be generally smaller. But that is a bad year. 2011 was a bad year. Um, but 2010 certainly made up for that, and then some. Um, back in uh, 2017, had a great year here. Had a great year here. Um, we had, um, a, a February was a good month uh, of this year. January was a bad month, and March, uh, well, we've only had six days of it, but uh, a, a small declining amount. But um, have a look at this. There's lots of red in there. This shows the volatile nature of this return stream. However, when you look at the curve itself, so the equity curve, you clearly see, I'll just uh, reflect a drawdown percent in this, turn off the volume, put on my stagnation. So over the course, and I'll put on the date range, um, come on date range, there we go. From 1970 up to current day, a marvellous re growth result of our non-optimised solution, but we did have a period of stagnation over 3,112 days. That's many years. And most people would say this strategy doesn't work. That's, of course, when we reached our maximum drawdown. So um, we'll just go to some of those statistics, but you clearly see it's a very good result. When you look at the, um, the result in dollar terms, we start with $100,000. We end up with 
um, 67 million in profit. We have a winning percentage of 37%. This is our non-optimised solution. A compound annual growth rate of close to 14% or 13.91. Our yearly average annual return of 1,483%. Now, do not get confused with compound annual growth rate versus average annual returns or annual returns. There are different kettles of fish. Compound annual growth rate relates to what you need to compound that initial deposit um, over the course of the time series to result in that final value. It's, it's effectively your, your rate of return. Or it's a linear regression result that says if you apply this percentage, this 13.91% to every year from your initial $100,000 start, you will end up with a final value of that level of equity. That's what compound annual growth rate means. So when people say 13%, do not think that that is an annual return. Um, some of our returns, if I go to the returns here, you'll see that some of our returns are very high. 186% uh, return, 36% return, 89% return, 23% return. Um, obviously, as our values are getting higher, um, and the fact that um, the reason why our returns are getting lower here, I just need to demonstrate this. This is because, unfortunately, when I turn my volume back on, you'll see that we haven't ha been able to get the benefit of compounding from 1980 onwards. That's because we reach maximum lot exposure and we cannot get the principles of compounding affecting this later time series. However, we are developing solutions in our algorithms to at least theoretically um, split our trades when they get to this level, thanks to Burrup uh, from our forum member who suggested this, which enables us to see the full effect of compounding in a theoretical world where we didn't reach our broker limitations. But in this case, this has been significantly stifled by the maximum lot um, availability from our broker. So that's the, um, that's the result looking at a non-optimised result. But now what I want to do is we want to clearly see the difference between our optimised result and our non-optimised result. So our optimised result produced a, higher, a slightly higher return of, say, 15% compound annual growth rate as opposed to, say, 14%. Our maximum drawdown was lower in our optimised result of around about 15% as opposed to 18%. Our CalMAR ratio, which is the MAR ratio effectively, uh, was higher in our optimised result of 1 against 0.77. So this tells us for pound for pound our optimised solution is more powerful and that's because it's responding to the more recent nature of the trending condition. Number of wins slightly higher, 40.76 um, versus the 37% uh, wins with our non-optimised solution. So um, just look at the difference now. There's a small difference between the optimised and the uh, non-optimised solution produces in total equity over the run. So um, we'll bring up uh, our dollar equity. So just keep in the back of your mind, 67.2 million was our um, diverse non-optimised result. And 105 million was our optimised result. Now, this is where the difference is important. That small improvement in our MAR ratio, or risk-adjusted return, has led to the compounding effect significantly improving this. And this is understated because of the maximum lot impact. So I hope this particular video demonstrates that, firstly, we are not using curve fit solutions here because we enforce design considerations before we ever start the data mining process. The data mining process is simply used to allow our trends to slightly adjust, or, or our trend design considerations, to slightly adjust to more recent trends in recognition of the fact that markets adapt and the nature and quality of trend changes over the course of time. Therefore, um, as we uh, go through this process, we will be periodically at, say, 10-year intervals using another 10-year sample to slowly change the nature of our trend-following systems, not by the design itself, but by the values we choose. So I hope you enjoyed this presentation, and stay tuned for more. Cheers.